Hi everyone, I'm delighted to have author, advocate, coach, and consultant for the food allergy community, Sloan Miller, here with us this afternoon. Sloan is here to talk about food allergy confidence during the holidays. This should be a practical and informative session, so I'm really glad you've joined us here today. This webinar is offered by Kids with Food Allergies as part of its educational outreach program. I'm Linda Mitchell, Senior Vice President at the Asthma and Allergy Foundation of America, or AFA. Kids with Food Allergies is a division of AFA. I have the privilege of being your moderator this afternoon. Today's webinar is made possible through a sponsorship by Mylan Specialty. We rely on donors and corporate partners like Milan Specialty for the financial support that enables us to develop educational programs for families. Guest presenters for all of our webinars are doing so as volunteers without compensation. They also prepare their presentations on their own based on the clinical evidence when applicable. On behalf of AFA and KFA, I'm very grateful for Sloan to donate her time to be here with us today. Holidays are such stressful times for many of us. Trying to keep our kids safe while navigating sticky situations sometimes can really be a challenge. Sloan will walk us through some ways to tackle these situations with confidence. Please remember that this webinar is of a general nature only and is not medical advice or legal advice. You should consult your own physician for any medical advice you seek with regard to food allergies and other medical conditions you may be managing. If you have questions during the presentation, you can enter them in the questions box in the GoToWebinar control panel that displays on your device. And at the end of the Sloan's presentation, we will answer those questions as time allows. Today's webinar is being recorded. You will receive a follow-up email in a few days, and it will have a link to the video recording as well as a list of related resources. After Sloan's presentation, we will stop to give away some wonderful gifts from our corporate supporters, Dr. Lucy and Sunbutter. The recipients of those gifts will be picked randomly from those still in attendance later on. And when we end the webinar, you will see a survey. Please share your impressions with us, and we will take your feedback seriously to improve the future direction of our webinar series. So um, let's go ahead and introduce Sloan. Um, Sloan Miller is a licensed social worker. She was born with food allergies and developed asthma and environmental allergies as a child. In 2006, she started Please Don't Pass the Nuts, an award-winning food allergy blog. She is the author of Allergic Girl, Adventures in Living Well with Food Allergies by Wiley in 2011. She counsels children, adults, and families with food allergies. Sloan has a bachelor's degree from Sarah Lawrence College, her master's in fine arts degree from Bennington College, and a master of social work degree from New York University. She is a licensed master social worker. So thank you for joining us here today, Sloan. Let's get started. Thanks so much for having me, Linda. Uh, and thank you so much for your team and AFA and Mylan for putting this together. Um, holidays. Oh, I'm going to read the poll. Wait. How many years <laughs> have you managed food allergies? So um, it looks like the majority of you have either had this a very long time, eight years plus, um, or are newly diagnosed or have family members that are newly diagnosed. So that um, gives me a, a good idea. OK. Is there, are there more poll numbers? It's very exciting. This poll is very exciting. <laughs> oh, there are. OK. So have you created new or different holiday traditions? Most of you have. By a large majority, most of you have, which is fantastic. And I think there's one more question. How confident are you about coping with food allergies during a holiday? So only 4% of you are very confident. The majority of you are fairly confident. Uh, and 36% are so-so. But zero are have zero percentage confidence. That's great. So no one feels like completely at a loss. Um, the majority of you, it sounds like, feel like have somewhat of a handle on it, but would like to talk more about how to make it the most enjoyable experience possible. That's my sense. Uh, so here we are, food allergy confidence during the holidays. And uh, Linda actually gave um, uh, a nice overall about who I am and what I do. And just to reiterate, um, uh, I have a website called Allergic Girl at allergicgirl.com. And my motto is, just because you have a restricted diet does not mean you have a restricted life. I was born with food allergies and developed uh, asthma, environmental allergies, and eczema, all of which I have 
um, and all of which I manage. I have eczema right now at the beginning of the frost season. It's definitely here. Um, and, uh, and I started my blog in 2006 called Please Don't Pass the Nuts, uh, which I still write. And I have my book in 2011 called Allergic Girl Adventures in Living Well with Food Allergies. And it's the first lifestyle guide that was written by an adult with food allergies that really dives deep into the how of living well. You get the diagnosis from the doctor and they say, avoid your allergen. But no one tells you all the social situations that you have to deal with like holidays, how do you do it? Uh, so that's what my book does, and that's what we're going to talk a little bit about today. Um, mainly, I think the main thing I want to tell you is that I have had this my entire life, and I've done every iteration for every holiday that you can think of. Um, I have felt defensive. I have been proactive. I have made calls. I have hosted. I have gone to friends' houses. I have gone to restaurants. I have gone to family. I have not gone at all. I have brought my own food. I thought I had the correct conversation with whomever, and it turned out not to be the correct conversation. I ended up not eating anything. Um, I've done everything uh, because I've had this my entire life and holidays come up every year. So I've done every iteration one could think of and what I'm going to talk about today is really what I've come to after a lifetime of struggling with um, challenging family members that get it or don't get it and my own feelings about how do I be in this space in this time. Uh, okay, so next slide, please. Great. So we're going to talk about these basic concepts first about creating food allergy confidence. And I have three basic steps. One is understanding your food allergy diagnosis. Two is communicating your food allergy diagnosis. And three is forming positive and supportive relationships around your diagnosis. Um, please note, when I say you, I am talking about uh, the caregiver or the person that has food allergies. And what I don't know from the, po uh, from the poll that we did is how many of you are the person with food allergies. For example, I'm the person with the food allergy or how many of you are caregivers. But all the you are the people that have the food allergy or are caregiving. Uh, so next slide, please. So the desired result when you have food allergy confidence, and confidence comes in many stages and it will change over time, uh, but the desired result is to be able to go through the world and feel confident about your place in it and that you are able to take care of your needs in multiple situations and that you have options and choices. This is not black and white, but this is about making appropriate choices for risk management over the course of a lifetime in order to live confidently. Next slide, please. So here's a quick review of food allergy basics. I know that you all know this information, but it's important to go over this information, especially as we head into the holiday season. Food allergies are real and serious, and diagnoses are on the rise. 15 million Americans have at least one diagnosed life-threatening food allergy. That's 6 million children and 9 million adults. I don't know if that number surprises you, but it's actually more adults than children right now. Um, as of right now, there is no cure for food allergies. The only treatment is avoidance of the known allergen. And I have to tell you, that is the same speech that I got when I saw my pediatric allergist over 30 years ago. When I asked him, what do I do? He said, don't eat what you're allergic to. It is the same prescription. Next slide, please. Uh, so there are um, eight foods that, according to the FDA, can cause 90% of food allergic reactions, peanuts, tree nuts, fish, shellfish, dairy, eggs, wheat, and soy. Personally, I am tree nuts, fish, and shellfish. Um, however, anyone can be allergic to anything at any time. Next slide, please. Uh, as you all know, uh, epinephrine is considered the first-line treatment for anaphylaxis, which is a severe life-threatening food allergic reaction. 
Thanks, Melanie. Next slide. So here we are. So be proactive. So now that we know what the basics of food allergies are, uh, we need to get a proper diagnosis. And to get a proper diagnosis, it's very important that you either go to a center of food allergy excellence, and that there are many, many of them across the United States right now, mostly in hospitals, centers or institutes that are devoted exclusively to food allergy versus your local allergist that will be involved with allergy, asthma, and immunology. Uh, here in New York, it's the Jaffe Institute at Mount Sinai. There are many, many across the country. KFA has that information. Um, but you want to find, if you're going to see an allergist, a local allergist, you need to find an allergist that actually knows about food allergy, and not all of them do. You might be surprised to learn that food allergies are not something that are taught in medical school. It is something that an allergist who is schooled in allergy, asthma, and immunology learns on the job. So not every allergist knows about food allergy. Not every allergist has a lot of food allergy patients. So you want to make sure that you're seeing an allergist that has a lot, a lot of experience. Um, you have to learn how to avoid your allergens because that is the prescription. There is nothing else. Um, that is the first and most critical step of uh, for food allergy management. Um, so again, this is part of being proactive. Avoid your known allergen. Uh, however, it's not always possible, so you need to carry emergency uh, medication of epinephrine and auto injectors and know how and when to use them. Create an anaphylaxis action plan and know how and when to use that. So additionally, part of all of this being proactive is really understanding um, and having the tools uh, to keep yourself safe. So having an anaphylaxis action plan is part of it, but if you don't understand when and how to use it, it's not going to be very helpful to you. Next slide, please. So part of creating this confidence is truly deeply understanding food allergy for you, what that means for you, not what it means for your neighbor's child, not what it means for your support group leader's child, what it means for you, your family, your child, or you personally. So um, understanding your particular needs because, again, exposure, more often than not, it's not a question of if it will happen, but when exposure will happen. So how do you understand this diagnosis? And have you explored all of your questions? This is something that I talk about and spend several sessions on with my food allergy counseling clients. And what I suggest they do is create a one-page document of questions about food allergies, testing, reactions, mild versus severe, what to look for, casual contact. These are really important questions to leave the office with. Very often, someone will get a diagnosis. Again, the doctor will say, yep, according to your history and our tests, you or your child are allergic to this. Don't eat it. And then you leave the office and you think, well, wait a minute. What does that mean? What do I need to avoid? What do I need to do? How do I, how do, I do this? So there are questions that you have. And what I'm suggesting is that you write these questions down on one piece of paper or a Word document and create a consultation with your allergist. You want to know what kind of tests were performed. What do the test results mean? Uh, KFA actually has a fantastic webinar done by David uh, Stupkis, Dr. Stupkis, about this very issue, about what tests mean, which tests you need, um, about your own history and tests, how they intersect. I highly recommend uh, looking at that webinar. So questions like, what is my full food allergy list? What do I need to avoid? What about how to read processed uh, food labels? What about may contain statements? Now here's another really important point. Do you know what you need to avoid, but do you also know what you do not need to avoid? I find that many families leave a doctor's appointment and are avoiding all kinds of foods and all kinds of activities unnecessarily because they're really not clear about how to avoid their allergen and what they don't need to avoid. Very, very crucial. Uh, questions like casual contact, 
real risks of casual contact, what's a mild, uh, mild reaction versus a severe reaction, what is anaphylaxis, what does it look like? Uh, these are very, very crucial questions. Now for parents of food allergic children, your children will have different questions than you and they're usually very creative and, um, and they are the things that are worrying them the most. What I suggest is that they, because this is about them if they have the food allergy, they write down their own questions and that they, if they can, unless they're shy, in which case you can, but if they can, ask their doctor directly. Doctors love questions from kids, especially pediatricians, especially pediatric allergists. They love when kids ask questions and they love talking directly to your child. Uh, and it also gives your child a huge sense of confidence to ask a question and have a direct answer when it's something that directly affects them. So if you can, have them write down their questions. Also, write down their answers. So when the child says to you, well, what did the doctor say about may contain labels? You have it nicely written out. You can print it out. You can put it in their room so they can refer to it. Really, really helps. So here's a, a little something additional. Um, if, for example, you have a doctor that doesn't want to answer your questions, doesn't want to meet for a consultation, doesn't want to take the 10, 15, or 20 minutes that it might take to answer fully the questions that you have about a food allergy diagnosis, I suggest considering going to another doctor. These are crucial questions that you need to know in order to keep yourself safe. And if your doctor is unwilling to engage you in a reasonable process of supporting yourself and your health, then I have to really question if that's the right doctor for you. Remember, doctors are not doing you a favor by answering your questions. This is their job. And in this instance, they are a service provider. You are the client, they are providing a service. If they don't provide the service that you need, take your business elsewhere. Why? It is crucial, crucial, crucial for you to understand every single aspect of this medical need because only then can you communicate what your medical need is to others in a clear, concise, factual manner. For parents, this is additionally important because you want to help your child be able to explain this to themselves so they understand their food allergy and explain it to other people when you're not around. The older they get and the more independent they get, they're going to be on play dates, they're going to be on soccer trips, they're going to be cheerleading, they're going to be in drama school, wherever they're going to be, they're going to need to understand their diagnosis and be able to explain it clearly, concisely, and factually. Remember, you are modeling behavior for your children. If you are unclear about a diagnosis or feel nervous about it, your child is not going to magically be clear and not feel nervous about it. They're going to be unclear and feel nervous about it. So go back, get your questions answered. Okay, finally, we're up to communication. So using the information that you now have from this effective consultation that you've gone back and had with your board certified medical health provider, allergist or pediatric allergist or pediatrician, you can now explain your needs to people around you in a very clear way. And it doesn't have to be a long page worth. Usually, uh, the, the shorter the sentence is and the quicker you get out the information, the better. Basically, Food allergies are real and serious, and this is what I need in order to keep myself safe. For me, effective communication includes these three parts, being clear, being factual, and being firm. For me, and now just know, these, these again, these are steps that I practice with my food allergy counseling clients over session. So this is not something you're going to get immediately and you should be able to do this after this webinar, but something to think about Think about how you are communicating information to those around you. Think, are you being factual? Are you being concise? Are you being clear, direct, assertive? Think about how you are communicating. Um, when I say clear, I mean short, simple, concise sentences that convey food allergy 
facts. The fact is food allergies are real and serious. Factual means not using exaggerated language when you are discussing a medical need or scare tactics or you know just keeping things very, very simple and very, very factually based. Anaphylaxis is real, serious, a life-threatening reaction, period. And firm. In this case, yes, firm is my third one. In this case, food allergies, any medical need, is non-negotiable. This is not a preference. This is a medical need. If it can't be accommodated, that's fine. But appropriate accommodations will need to be made by me or by the situation. So again, this is about being assertive, not aggressive. Um, uh, and this is about tone as well when you are communicating. Um, if you listen to the tone that I'm using in this space right now, uh, I am using, I'm speaking slowly, I'm speaking calmly, my face is registering relatively neutral. I can see myself. You can see me if you if you have your video turned on. Um, I don't look agitated or excited or angry or defensive. Um, and neutral is as neutral as you can get when you are relaying this information will allow the listener to really hear it. And that's what you want. You want them to hear this information. So again, my tone is, is pleasant, it's polite, it's neutral. Uh, I think you should always be nice and pleasant and polite, but also clear, concise, and firm. All right? And bottom line, remember, not only are food allergies not negotiable, but you have nothing to prove to anyone. You do not have to prove that food allergies are real and serious. They just are. Um, and you are looking for an honest and clear communication with whomever you're talking to, whether it's a chef at a restaurant or a, a parent-in-law or a teacher. You are communicating your needs clearly, and what you're looking for is an honest response. Sometimes that'll be, no, we can't accommodate you, or sometimes it might be, we're nervous about it, T walk us through it. Great, that's an accommodation. Great, we're now communicating clearly. Um, the bottom line message when you're communicating, again, just to reiterate, is that food allergies are real and serious, and this is how I need to take care of my needs. Um, it's very important, again, as a parent of a food allergic child, you are modeling language and behavior for that child. So if they see you advocating in a way that is neutral, is factual, is clear, uh, they will be able to model that when they need to communicate for themselves either uh, in middle school or in high school whenever they need to start doing that. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, support. So um, the support generally that you're asking for is um, emotional because you know how to take care of your medical needs because you had an effective consultation with your doctor, right? So, um, again, if you still feel unclear, go back to the doctor, ask all of the questions that you need to. Please don't be shy with them. They want to answer your questions. They love answering questions. They get to talk about the science stuff. They love that. So ask the doctor your questions. Understand, um, understand your diagnosis. And then create support. Support is incredibly important. Um, safe friends. I have lots of safe friends. I've created lots of safe friends. And generally, they are non-judgmental. They're supportive. They're flexible. They're open. They understand that food allergies are not negotiable. This isn't a preference. This is a medical need. And they're there to support you in whatever way they need to. Um, a food allergy ally is someone that is maybe an acquaintance, like a chef or a general manager, someone you don't deal with every day, maybe a distant coworker or an HR person that, again, understands this is a medical need and offers their support. It's great. Uh, connecting with groups like AFA and KFA, really, really crucial. Both connecting online and having an offline support in the real world, offline support. If you need additional support, someone like myself, a mental health worker, someone locally or someone online, you should absolutely also seek that out. Um, for parents, uh, this is incredibly crucial 
to have safe friends and have a support network. Why? Because you want your children to have safe friends and be able to create a, a support network. Um, I can't underscore this enough, but it's really crucial to help your children be able to find safe friends in their life. Friends that um, are open, are honest, are loving, and they need to know how to pick and choose who is that, who is going to support them in their time of need. And this is not just a food allergy community thing. This is, uh, we all need those kinds of friends uh, that support us, that are there for us, that can help us laugh at ourselves or laugh at, a, at an absurd situation, that will go to the doctor with us or uh, go to the principal's office with us, um, uh, that will hold our hand. and be in that friend in return. So when you are seeking support for yourself, know that you are modeling that behavior for your child. Also help them to learn how to, to seek that kind of support in their friendship groups. It'll be very, very important for them. Uh, remember, they are watching you like a hawk, whether they are 15 or 5 or 5 months old, uh, especially if they're 15 and they're like, oh, I'm not paying attention to you. They are paying attention to every single thing that you're doing. So they will watch you and they will emulate you. Next slide, please. So again, just to reiterate, this is about creating food allergy confidence. These are my three steps, understanding your food allergy diagnosis, communicating it, and forming positive and supportive relationships. You're going to need all of these skills during the holidays. So next slide, please. So now we're getting to the holidays. Um, in my experience, there are three, generally speaking, three types of um, families uh, and, and food allergy responses or responses to the food allergy diagnosis. Some families right on board, and this is extended families. Some extended families get right on board immediately, and that's wonderful. You barely need to explain. They say, we got it, great. Um, I, my, uh, I have three cousins. Um, I only have four cousins, first cousins in life, but I have three on one side. They're all brothers. The youngest of them, who's closest in age to me, is like that. He and his wife, immediately on board. I've been to Thanksgiving at their house for a million years. They always let me go first. Everything's labeled. They keep any boxes or labels of other foods. I bring my own food. Um, they're very kind, very supportive. They check in with me a month ahead of time to talk about the, the menu. Fantastic family members. Uh, and, and I return that favor by um, thanking them, sending them thank you notes, letting them know how much that kind of support means to me and um, supporting their support of my need. So most families will be in a second group. They will need a period of adjustment. Eventually, they will get it. Um, uh, for example, there is a friend of the family. She's a very dear woman. Um, the first three times that she came to my family's house for um, the holidays, she brought a house gift, and the house gift was a platter of mixed nuts. I'm allergic to tree nuts. It was an entire platter of mixed nuts. Um, uh, and my mother kept saying, Sloan can't eat nuts. We don't all know nuts in the house. Uh, she's like, oh, I'm so sorry. She did it three times. <laughs> but by the fourth time, she brought flowers. So she just needed gentle reminding. She eventually got it. Um, she's such a loving, warm, wonderful person. Uh, it just took time. And um, remember, if you're newly diagnosed, it took a lot of time for you to understand this too, and you're probably still understanding it. Extended family members, it's going to take them that much longer. So be patient, explain, talk with them. Some family members will never get it. And by never, I mean never. You will be you will be hitting your head against the wall for a million years. And of my three uh, male cousins uh, that are all brothers, they're all related to each other. They've all known me longer than I've known me because they're older. The eldest of the three brothers uh, doesn't get it at all. He still will ask me if I can just scrape nuts off the brownies. I could not scrape nuts off any brownies and eat that brownie and not expect to go to the hospital. Um, it, it's a curious thing that he doesn't get it. However, uh, and I've explained it till I'm blue and I'm done explaining because he's not going to get it for whatever reason and that's okay. 
he still loves me and I love him and that love and support is still there uh, I just won't let him cook brownies for me ever so uh, with him I just need to really manage my expectations um, again going to his house for uh, Thanksgiving which I did for a few years I just bought my own food because it was very clear to me they did not understand anything about my food allergies they really weren't interested in understanding it fine I'll just bring my own food and that's what I did um, so I managed my expectations with that kind of family member and I put my health first uh, remember that um, that you have nothing to prove or defend um, about food allergies they're real they're serious this is what it is and so food uh, food allergy family members that don't quite get it um, uh, and we're going to talk about those uh, in a minute. Um, uh, it, it's it's very frustrating, but it is absolutely manageable. Um, so be patient, try and access the love, and try and keep food allergies out of the discussion. So now we have uh, some uh, Q A's that um, Linda, uh, I think that were gathered, right, Linda, before um, before that were sent in. And these these are very very typical. And I want to say at the outset that all of these Q's and A's I have experienced a version of it firsthand. And so I'm really speaking to you from a place of compassion. Of I have been there. I have been frustrated. I have been upset. I have felt isolated. I have felt lonely. I have felt made different by family members, and I felt it loved, accepted, brought in, um, connected by other family members. So, first question: My family just doesn't understand. They don't realize how serious food allergies can be. They treat me like I'm making a big deal out of a little issue. I think all of us on this call have had this happen to us, um, and this is exhausting. This is an exhausting battle to fight. My question to us as a group uh, is to really think about what is this battle really about? Um, most extended families, unless they've seen a, a food allergic reaction firsthand, they're not going to get this initially. They're just not. It's going to take some time. Um, because as long as it took you to understand it, they don't live with it. Maybe they see you once a year. Maybe they haven't seen you in 10 years. Um, it's going to take them a much longer time. So certainly help and explain it to them um, as much as you have patience for. However, again, the most important person here is you. As long as you understand your needs, and you know how to take care of them, and you are carrying your emergency medication, and you have your anaphylaxis action plan, you don't need other people to understand every nuance other than it's real, it's serious, it's a medical need. So from that perspective, there is no deal. You don't need to make any kind of deal out of, out of this. And by the way, it took me years to get this point, years. But if you, if you explain it this way, here are the facts. I have food allergies, can't eat this, this, and this, these are my needs, and that's it, then there is no deal. The deal, and this I'm going back to this question, the deal comes when we are trying to manage other people's reactions to this diagnosis. Either manage their reactions, manage their interest level, manage their commitment to our health or our specific needs. And once you try and manage someone else, I have to say, you kind of never can win. You cannot control anyone else's reactions or feelings or commitment level to a personal need, um, which, by the way, that's true across the world for anything having nothing to do with food allergies, just that's interpersonal relationships. So if you take out the wish of wanting to manage how other people are going to react you really want them to get on board, you really want them to be gung-ho about it, you really want them to, to be as, as nervous about it or as excited about it as you are. If you take that out of the equation, what you're left with is these are the food allergies, they're real, they're serious, this is what I need to do to take care of myself, and that's the deal, and that's it. Um, you don't need anyone else to buy into your medical need. Uh, you know how to manage it. 
whether people get on board with you or not um, is immaterial because you know how to take care of yourself. You are everything that you need already. So all of those other feelings about, well, they don't understand to the level that I want them to understand are important and they're important to explore and to think about, to think about your reactions, to think about what's going on with the family. However, when it comes to actually getting to sit down at the table, um, there, is, there doesn't have to be a deal. Food allergies are a medical need, they're real and they're serious, and they will be respected. And that's it. See, there's no deal. Next slide. My husband's family wants us to spend a few days with them for the holidays. However, their house is full of my child's allergens and they refuse to put them away. Yep, been there. Absolutely, 100%. So my questions here um, really go back to um, understanding a food allergy diagnosis. So allergens existing in the world are normal. Allergens existing in homes, in schools, in restaurants, um, on public transportation, uh, at the workplace. These are, this is just the world. Allergens live in the world. And so it's very important for you to understand uh, what the real risk is for your family, your diagnosis, um, for being in a space where the allergens are. Uh, that's the first thing, is really get the medical information about that. Second thing is, Again, let's look at the battle that's underneath the food allergy question. If you're, if, and I, this sounds like it's an in-law, right? It's an in-law question, husband's family, right? So if your in-laws refuse, they're like, no, we might, we want to see you, but we're not going to make any accommodations. None. <laughs> we refuse. My question to you would be to think about um, what's really going on here. Because my, my sense is what's really going on is that this has nothing to do with food allergies, but this has something to do with some kind of long-standing battle between your in-laws and you, your in-laws and your partner. Something else is going on. Um, usually, uh, uh, what I find very often is that food allergies um, and the, 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 the nature of them get mapped on to other dramas, let's say. So when I talk about not making a deal out of something, I'm talking about separating food allergy, medical need from family underlying drama. And once you separate those two things, it becomes very, very much easier to deal with what's at hand. This is not negotiable. Dealing with family is always a negotiation, but a medical need, not negotiable. So. In this instance, um, if your in-laws really want to see you and you want to see them, um, you should see them. If they're not willing to make any kind of accommodation, uh, I would still try and connect with them because they clearly love you and you want your child to see their grandparents and that's a very important relationship to maintain. Do not get into a battle about food allergy and accommodation. If your child's little, just bring the food with them. If they're older, talk about making other dishes. If you're concerned about them being in the house, talk to your, to your board-certified medical provider. Um, find a creative solution about connecting to the love that is there with extended family, but keeping food allergies out of it, out of the battle. Next slide, please. My mother wants to have a pecan pie and pumpkin pie for desserts. That sounds too risky for my child to be around. So here, um, sounds too risky doesn't mean is too risky. And this is a very important conversation to have with your doctor about what is the real risk about a pie sitting on a table. Um, the pie is not going to be thrown at you. It's not a pie-throwing holiday party. Um, so really, what is the risk of going to an event where your allergens will be present? Allergens exist in the world. And the sooner we understand how to interact with that world safely, the better. So this is, again, a question. Go back to your board-certified medical health provider and really talk about what is the real risk of inert ingredients sitting at a table especially given the age of your child, given the allergens, something to discuss. Next slide, please. 
My family wants a traditional Thanksgiving dinner with all the usual family recipes. What should I do? My 18-month-old is allergic to many foods and those recipes. So here again, um, and as you'll see, there's a theme. Um, holidays, and by the way, this is not just food allergy families. This is all families around the world. Holidays tend to bring up family drama. And, um, you know, try not to get pulled into a drama um, about what everyone wants versus a medical need. Remember, medical need is not negotiable. You, you, you can't. There's, this, is, this, is a, this, is, this is black and white. Food allergies are real and serious, and period, that's it. Where we're going to do the holiday, what we're going to eat, who's going to host, how are we going to cook, all of those things um, can be worked around. Um, so try not to get into a nitty-gritty battle of that my family wants this, but this is not safe for my child. It's not safe for your child, therefore you're going to be doing something else. Um, stay firm, stay clear about what your medical needs are. Uh, if you're hosting, there's a whole range of things that you can do um, and keep it safe in your space. If you're going to someone else's house, again this is 18 month old son, your 18 month old child is not necessarily going to be gumming turkey and pecan pie. So. Most people bring food for their 18-year-old child anyway. If you're worried about them touching stuff, if you're, you know, again, talk to your doctor about um, about what the real risk is. Um, if you're looking for uh, new recipes, there are tons and tons, and aren't we so lucky to live in this age where so many wonderful, wonderful writers and cookbook authors have created a wealth of recipes of deliciousness that are free from the top eight. I know KFA has a whole list of those. I think there are going to be some at the end of this webinar. Additionally, uh, Sibel Pascal, uh, who's a colleague of mine, has two or three books that are cooking top eight free, both dessert and savory, delicious recipes that everyone will love. There are so many options um, to create a new tradition. And that's if that's what you need to do, that's what you're going to do. Next slide, please. I feel like my child is missing out on so much for the holidays with all of her food allergies. So I want to let you know that many, 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 many adults feel this way about children uh, who are newly diagnosed with food allergies. And many adults who have uh, adult onset food allergies also feel this way about, um, about missing out. Um, so when it comes to parents, though, and children, parents who do not have food allergies and children that do have food allergies, uh, this might sound like a very radical concept, um, but I say this with love and compassion, that your children are clean slates and they have no idea what they're missing unless you tell them that they're missing out on something. So honestly, children could care less if they're eating an Oreo or a food allergy free Oreo, unless you tell them the real Oreo is better. And then of course they're going to think the real Oreo is better. Um, it's about how we normalize food allergies and this whole experience of holidays and eating and food. Um, uh, just a little side note, for example, my both of my parents love marzipan, love, love, love marzipan, which is a uh, sugar almond paste. Um, and uh, we had it when I was a kid uh, in the house and they were like little pear shaped, like little fruit shaped things that were made out of this almond paste. My parents would love it. But they never said to me, Sloan, if only your life would be perfect if only you could eat marzipan. Uh, all I knew was that it was almonds and I couldn't eat it. I had no interest in it because it was almonds and that was scary to me. I didn't want it. Uh, but I think it would be a very, I think it would be a very tough thing if they had said to me, "This is one of the great delights of the dessert world, and we only wish that you could have it." Uh, I think I would have felt like, "Oh well, I wish I could have it too." Um, but they didn't. I had tons of other stuff to eat, and I never gave it a second thought. So um, this brings me to this next really big kind of radical concept and our next slide, which is about letting go and reframing. Thank you. So um, 
for many parents with children with a newly diagnosed food allergy or food allergies for a long time, and if you don't have food allergies yourself, there is some personal emotional work to do, especially around the holidays. And uh, just a sidebar, there are many wonderful mental health professionals that you can help with this, including myself, local psychologists, um, counselors, and social workers in your area uh, if you need extra support. But mainly, when it comes to holidays, you may need to mourn your concept of holiday. And this is a really, really big one, especially if you've got a newly diagnosed child. You may need to mourn your concept of what these magical holidays or your dining future was going to be. Um, because in the present, in the now, food allergies are real and they're serious and they're here to stay. And that is the reality, not some future, not some past right now. And so, you know, if Oreos are something special to you and something that you had every single holiday and your child can't have them and you feel badly for your child, you will need to mourn that your child is not going to have the Oreo experience that you were hoping they were going to have. And you're going to feel frustrated, and you're going to feel angry, and you're going to feel sad. And these are real feelings. They're valid feelings. They need to be expressed to your partner, to your support group, to a mental health professional, to your parents, um, to, to groups like KFA. Um, because um, um, because, why because? Because you don't want to pass on these thoughts to your children. They, holidays are new for them, especially if they're little. They're 18 months old. This is brand new. They don't even know what's happening. This is, this is, and not only is it new to them, but this is normal. I grew up, um, knowing that I, remembering my first anaphylactic response to nuts when I was two, and so I grew up understanding the world as I have food allergies and I can't eat those things. And that is my normal. That's completely normal for me. So what's normal for them is different than what is normal for you. But it doesn't make it any less normal. So uh, it's very important for you to recognize that your child is not you. They're going to have a different childhood than you had. And by the way, with or without food allergies, that's the same for every parent and every child. Parents are, uh, children are not you. They are their own separate person. They are having their own experience of the world. And this is their normal. So unless you tell them that there's some other better normal that they should have, this is their normal. And by the way, that better normal doesn't exist for anyone. It doesn't exist for Martha Stewart. It doesn't exist for Julia Child. It doesn't exist for Angelina Jolie. There is no perfect holiday normal out there. So once you realize that uh, your child is a separate person and they're going to have their own childhood with their own experiences that have nothing to do with you, including their food allergies and not being able to eat foods that you may have eaten, they're going to eat other yummy, delicious things, and they're going to love those things, and that's going to be their new normal. That's going to be their new Oreo. Um, so set, help them, once you can let go of, of, and of that wish for them to have the perfect holiday that you had as a child, know that their holiday is perfect to them. Uh, and it's normal for them. And that's part of reframing this and understanding uh, and normalizing that this, uh, this experience is really about their childhood and creating a wonderful experience for them that they're going to have memories of. Um, so part of the reframing uh, is to keep your focus on the focus of the event and I know we all get very focused on food around the holidays food 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 but the truth is that these holidays are actually about getting together with family and spending time with family food is a vehicle for that but food is not love food is food a cookie is a cookie and love is love and they're very separate things and despite what your grandmother may have told you oh here's a cookie because I love you they're actually very separate things and the more we separate them the better uh, for everyone so ultimately what children crave is your time 
and your attention. That's really what they want. Um, of course, they'd love a cookie too because they love sweets, but they really want your time and attention. Uh, the memories that I have of my family and spending time with my family, and I again, I grew up with food allergies, asthma, eczema, and uh, environmental allergies. So I've had this my entire life, and uh, including all the time I have with my grandparents. But the, what I remember is, um, for example, these are my grandmother's pearls, and um, and I get to wear them, and I have them, and I remember the experience of um, her bestowing them upon me, and that's a very special experience. I don't remember not eating her homemade gefilte fish that I was allergic to. <laughs> Who wants it? I wasn't that interested in it. Or, for example, my other grandparents. Um, the time that I spent with them where they individually, my, my grandmother taught me how to crochet, which I still don't know how to do. It was really hard. But hours and hours spent trying to learn was wonderful time spent together. And my grandfather, who taught me how to play the drums because he was a drummer, and he also taught me how to paint because he was a painter. Those are the precious memories I have. Time and togetherness. The food is secondary. Yes, we had food together too, but I remember the time together. Um, so, for example, if you're going to these holidays and you're worried about like, oh, they can't eat grandma's special pecan pie, your child would so much prefer to learn grandma's special knitting, knit one pearl two, or how grandma loves to go shopping, or um, grandma's old stories of when she met grandpa. It's really, truly about time and attention. Those are the things that your children deeply, deeply want. And it's your job to help yourself to get to the holiday so they can spend time with their family um, and with you. And food is secondary to that. Do whatever you need to do to get them in the room. Um, if that means bringing your own food, do it. If that means having lengthy conversations and teaching people um, about cross-contact and keeping labels and calling companies and they're open to it, fantastic. If they want to join you on a webinar like this so they can learn more, fantastic. If everyone wants to go to a restaurant, which I've done that once too, um, and dine out together, fantastic, do it. And if the restaurant isn't safe, Bring your own food. Call the restaurant ahead of time. Uh, but bring your own food. The point is to be together, and you want to access that love as much as possible. Food is secondary. Food allergies are real and serious. But the love is still there. You just need to find a way to get into it. Don't put the battle aside. Don't get, don't get into the battle, because the battle will get you nowhere. Access the love. I think, I think we're at the end. Yes, I think I think that is us. So that is that's my my final words to you is food allergies are real and serious. Try not to get into a battle about who wants what. Keep yourself safe, but go to the event um, Find creative solutions that are collaborative. Access the love that your family has for you. Be patient with them. Keep but keep yourself safe. Don't put yourself in any kind of risk if you have questions talk to your uh, board certified medical health provider about what the real risk is for you for being in a shared space with your allergens. Very important to know. But definitely have a wonderful time and a wonderful holiday. And thank you so much to KFA and AFA for letting me speak today. Well, thank you so much, Sloan. I really do appreciate your being here today. And it, it seems like a, a small thing to say, talk to your doctor, but sometimes, um, you know, ideas and all these kind of unusual situations that you are thinking of can kind of get blown out of proportion, and your doctor can really help you understand whether it's a real risk or not, and whether they're, like, they have done studies on things, and they'll be able to tell you if, you know, certain things are the risky, or maybe you're just overthinking it and and that's just such an important message to convey in and of itself because I know when my son was growing up you know I had to kind of just loop in the allergist and say hey can you please explain to him you know what's going on here so he can understand because of course the parent is never as smart as you know especially when they're becoming teenagers <laughs> mom and dad are never as smart as a doctor and so the doctor can kind of weigh in on a teenager especially on things we had a couple questions about teens that's why I bring up the teenager issue but um, oh and 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 just on the teen issue please 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 
empower them to ask the questions directly and like leave the room because they might start to have questions about an intimate nature if they're kissing and food allergies that they don't want you to hear but they need to get the answer directly from the doctor. So this is a really crucial time for them and it, it's really empowering to talk to an adult um, as a young person to and have them listen to you and give you the answers that you need. Very very true, very true. Thank you. Um, so thanks again. Um, I really appreciate your laying out some strategies and just some ideas about how people can look at the world, you know, with regard to the holidays and navigate it safer. And so thank you just so, so much. Um, so I'm going to move ahead to the giveaways because we're almost at 2 o'clock. I know. I don't know how that happened. It was so quick. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much again. Um, so we have two winners for Sun Butter giveaways, and that's going to be Kathleen Davis and Julie Masick. Thank you for joining us here tonight, um, this afternoon rather. And then for Dr. Lucy's, we have Trina Daniels and Leslie Totten or Totu or something along those lines. We've got your contact information, but we'll be in touch to make arrangements to get those gifts to you. Um, so um, since it's 2 o'clock, we're going to have to cut short the question and answers. Um, but I want to just let all of you know that the archive for this webinar will be available sometime next week, maybe even sooner. Um, and we'll be sending out a follow-up email in a few days with a link to that archive and some additional information to supplement this webinar discussion that you might find useful, like the handouts that we put um, in the GoToWebinar control panel in case you want to download them now. Um, so in conclusion, I just want to thank Sloan again for her time, for being here with us. Um, here's an important message about anaphylaxis, of course, at holidays especially. Stay safe this holiday. Be always prepared for managing anaphylaxis. Know your emergency plan. Um, check your epinephrine auto injectors. You know, there's been a recall just last week. Um, we have all the information about the AVQ recalls on our blog, and you can find out the latest in how to obtain um, information regarding turning them in and getting um, a prescription for a new. Um, uh, epinephrine auto injector that is um, you know an, a different brand device so that you can get back in stock and talk to your doctor if you you know don't have an ability to get a refill right now because I know there's some sporadic shortages around with EpiPen and other devices um, but they'll be able to guide you so that you can kind of stay safe in the interim um, so anyhow, um, in closing, I just want to tell you our next webinar will be Allergy Law Project, and they're going to have some um, really interesting discussions regarding legal issues about food allergies. So um, feel free to join us on Tuesday, December 1st at 1 p.m. Eastern. Um, and in conclusion, uh, Kids with Food Allergies is a division of the Asthma and Allergy Foundation of America, the nation's oldest and largest asthma and allergy charity. If you found today's session valuable and like for us to continue this webinar series, please consider um, keeping Kids with Food Allergies in your end of the year giving plans. Thank you again for joining us. Thank you, Sloan, and um, see you next month. Bye.